So, um, good morning, everyone. <laughs> and um, welcome to this workshop with uh, GitLab. It is called the Art and Craft of DevOps. I do see we have around 67, 60, almost 69 people joined in. Um, I'm Monmiri Ray. Um, I am part of uh, the customer success team within GitLab and in APAC. Um, I basically help uh, develop uh, pre-sales solutions uh, when it comes to DevOps or MLOps for our uh, customers. So with that, I will go into the agenda. So we're here for an hour. And um, in this one hour, um, we'll probably just go to a rough uh, intro, a little bit uh, history on the, uh, uh, on the journey of DevOps, understanding the economic lens. Um, then we'll go through a little bit of an experiment, a real world one. Um, the art and craft of it, which is the topic, um, and the revolution of it. Us as humans, how we play in this DevOps revolution, process and tools to help us enable in this revolution. And finally, GitLab and how we are, we are in this journey with an art and craft of it. So, just to begin with, um, DevOps, it's everywhere. Uh, whether it's in your app uh, development to any technology to actually even deploying machine learning. Uh, it's everywhere and currently what people are more looking for and where you are going to accelerate is actually the excellence of it. And to get to that in GitLab, we feel everyone can contribute. So going back to actually um, where it all started. Now, um, Patrick Debois, and apologies if, the if I can't pronounce it exactly right, but anyways, he's considered the uh, father of this um, terminology DevOps. It started around two 2008, uh, mainly um, because of the concept of how, um, how IT or around that time was so very siloed in, and there were so many apps, uh, specifically um, iOS apps uh, that were, um, that they wanted to go uh, productionized and they needed a framework to actually think about, okay, what would be a way for all humans to come together, change the whole culture of IT and collaborate together. So it's, 11 years old DevOps, and it's still growing and maturing and iterating and getting better um, every day. So that happened 2008, 2009, it sort of peaked. Um, and then came to 2011 and 2012, where then the economist was like, yay, this agile uh, way of working, um, you know, fast iteration, uh, but, what does that actually mean from a value perspective? So economists, when they look into something, they look at it as demand supply. So it's very simple. What they see is a certain price drop of something means more consumption of that and less consumption of something else. And so let's say, for example, tea. So a drop in price of tea means people will buy more of tea, less of actually coffee, and also anything that complements your tea, like uh, sugar or milk, more of that. So what does that mean for in reference to technology? So when mobile phones actually came out, what was considered from an economist point of view was actually a drop in price of communication. So similarly with AI, it's actually considered just very simple drop in price of machine prediction that substitutes human prediction. And data is actually the complement of that machine prediction. So for DevOps, it's even simpler. It's actually the drop in price of transaction cost within the product teams. So that actually is substituted by all the siloed teams and it's complemented by human judgment 
and automation. So from an economic perspective, it's just that drop of friction cost and transaction cost and complemented by automation and human judgment. So having a good understanding of that value in simple form within GitLab, this is how simple it can go. What is that whole cycle of DevOps? It's an infinite loop, which goes all the way from planning to ideating an idea to going all the way into actually the producing and the production of it through all these various steps to creating, to verifying, packaging, releasing, configuring, monitoring it. And with security um, in the development and defending in the operation side of it and a whole management lying on top of this infinite loop with every step iterating, feeding back um, and getting better all through that infinite loop. So that is in, shell, in nutshell, the whole life cycle of DevOps. So now we have a little bit understanding of that value um, and infinite loop. I want to go into a little bit of an experiment in a real world scenario. So um, now with COVID, I think everyone is a lot in is is watching a lot of movies, <laughs> streaming a lot of uh, YouTube's, uh, Netflix, Amazon Prime. So this is actually an example of a movie streaming engine and the process that actually flows with it. So traditionally, this is a company where the developers, they build a local streaming engine and uh, then they move to uh, MVP and then to production. The operations team then, it's like, great, now this is ready to produce. So we go into cloud and deploy it and scale it up. And so then the viewers can then enjoy the movie. Um, the viewers, if sometimes, if there's too many people joining in or, or not, they might actually have trouble streaming it might have quality problems, or they might actually love the movie. Um, and they send the feedback after seeing and going through that experience. The developers look into that, um, work on the feedback, and this sort of cycle continues. Seems fair, seems reasonable, but how can we do it better? So then what happens is initially, yes, the local streaming engine, uh, is built, ready for production, the operations team goes into cloud, but then what the developers and operations team come together and do is before the viewers actually watch it, they actually force failures, different failure scenarios into that production environment to actually be able to test um, all kinds of possible scenarios before the users actually come and feedback, all the sort of complaint, whether it's the quality or streaming or slow processing or whatever it is. So every possible failure injected into it, iterated, and concurrently the viewers watch it. This, uh, this phenomena is called chaos engineering. And, and the viewers then go to it. And then later, most of the feedback that comes is happy feedback and continuously it gets happier and happier and happier. This real world example is actually a real world example of Netflix. This happened around 2012, where they actually set up a building for failure or rather failure as a service, where they injected uh, failure through this chaos monkey tool uh, into and disable their production instances to actually be able to survive any sort of cost, uh, common type of failure which they had collected through time as well so that the customers are not impacted. Now, how did they actually do that is, um, so I did have an opportunity to actually have go through that process with them and the easiest answer they had is actually having the whole DevOps culture where they promote those frequent releases, high automation, software reliability, and have those motivations and objectives to uh, 
uh, celebrated through the wider audience with their larger business team that helps with promote the stability and the upgradability of the applications. Uh, so the greater goals with actually thriving in the business and going back to the customer success is easier achieved with this faster adaption of that DevOps culture. So it goes back to actually then the topic, the art and craft of DevOps. Yes, we have tools. Everybody loves our tools. Um, we have source code management, team size, continuous CI CD, continuous integration, continuous delivery, containers, security, coding, clouds, AI platform, all of it. But there is a whole human aspect to DevOps or the art of DevOps that is being able to creatively use the existing tools, use the existing historic existing data to innovate the strategy just the way as in that experiment to look into failure as a service was actually a creative way of embracing the DevOps culture and being able to collaborate it together uh, and make a unified decision without being siloed. So that is the art of DevOps. Now, to be able to embrace the art, there are a lot of changes that actually needs to go. And similar to actually the time we live, uh, there is changes that goes from localization to in you know, a historic era, we actually live in this postmodern globalized world. So similar in DevOps, um, the old way of going into from silo teams, there needs to be a cross-functional team or even one unit of building products together. Monolithics to microservices, manual test and release to automated test and release, manual configuration to infrastructure as code, team defined toolings to tool standardization and annual rather than annual release, more frequent, small iterative releases. So to talk about how we would actually embrace those changes, I'll talk about the first part, which is silo team to cross-functional uh, teams. And so the humans and teams in this revolution. This is a report from um, actually um, McKinsey, where they actually talk about um, how the future with automation is going to impact uh, the basic genuine skills in, in, in getting your tasks done. So obviously the physical manual skills is going to come down. Your social and emotional skills is going to get really, really high. And you're going to have so many tools. So being able to adapt and learn to it is actually get, going to get higher from 70 to 113. So when we look at the human skills and developers, um, from in the next 10 years, your problem solving skill needs to be eight times better. <laughs> your collaboration, interdependency, the adaptive continuous learning, all around 65X, uh, multitasking, leadership, empathy, all of it needs to get better and better and better. Now, that's an individual. So how does a whole team or an organization get to that level to help in that revolution. So how do we go from this localized silo to this globalized, visible, transparent, iterative, collaborative teams? To be able to do that, I will go now into actually certain processes and tools that can help you into that globalized, collaborative world. So the summary of the tools, firstly, it'll be talking about tools that help you in collaboration tools that can help you make fast, small changes, pipelines and automation, infrastructure and code, and general practices and how in GitLab we always improve. So change in communication experiences. First and foremost, it has to be open, it has to be inviting, and everyone collaborate together. So in GitLab we use Slack for it, where there are certain themes and certain topics to be able to actually get right into the information. There needs to be a balance of asynchronous and synchronous where you're, you have to have the liberty to have asynchronous conversation, but when it comes to the customers, be able to actually act on and jump on actively. 
Uh, so all about the little, little changes, slowly, slowly as the organizer making that slow process and having the framework done before even actually starting building those software. From private to shared documents. Um, this has been a lot of shift for a lot of people and in many people, they still actually uh, send e documents in emails and, and, and then there is a little bit uh, down the lane, no track of visibility and transparency. So very small changes, having a shared document for the collaboration of meetings or agendas and having that visibility transparency to be able to lower the friction is also key to the DevOps culture. Now boards. We're getting a little bit flavor of what a GitLab issue board actually looks like. Um, they are amazing. They started off from actually Kanbans. Uh, uh, it's a, it was a Japanese method, but they are just amazing for getting all sorts of stakeholders, team members, uh, starting to plan a project project all the way from the idea to production. And you can make it as complex and as creative and uh, as much as needed as, as a team or an organization. You can have, like, say, in this board, we have uh, open portfolio management issues and labels. You can have any sort of ways that helps you in that workflow. You can have la labels where you can put it as it's in development or it's in planning as it's needed for an organization. So it gives the whole team transparency, visibility, um, responsibility as well, and, and giving the milestones and roadmaps as well as uh, to actually understand how you're actually performing to be, is, is, is literally another step to making DevOps uh, easier. Um, here we see actually within, um, within GitLab, um, this is actually an issue where another good example of how we've actually collaborated. So this is, collaboration is not even internal. This is an external stakeholder who um, actually wanted a change in, um, in a product. So he wanted this cumulative flow diagram that, was, uh, that he wanted in his visual health office workflow. Our product team was able to incorporate that and, and be able to actually revisit it and actually help him uh, with his request. So again, the openness doesn't, shouldn't just be internally, the external openness of actually listening to the audience and taking that feedback and being able to collaborate to make your software better is also another key uh, lesson for DevOps. So back to the same kind of points and co collaboration sharing, visibility. So now that we actually have a good understanding of kind of setting the idea of planning, that's kind of what we did, all the things, all the tools that we actually needed to planning. That's great. Now we actually start building. And how do we actually start building? Everyone's probably heard of MVP, uh, the Minimal Viable Product. It's for, I think someone called Eric Rees, I think so, who started with that lean startup idea of building this sort of MVPs uh, before actually productionizing. Now, we believe that even before MVP, it's too big. How about we actually look into just features of the product, certain little, little step, and that can actually get it better and better. And even sometimes, Features are actually big. So how about MVC? So just minimal viable changes, little, little changes to the software to be able to unlock the velocity, take the feedback quickly and change it accordingly and keep on building the MVCs till we get to a good feature, till we get to a good product. And that's kind of the little, little steps that go from planning to building to then the later, later stages. Now, we've done the planning part and then we've slowly started doing the building part. Now, how do we go from that all the way to actually the production part of monitoring it? 
it is through various different pipelines of automation and integration. All of these boxes from plan to create, to verify, to package, to release, to configure, to monitor, all of it linked in this one pipeline, parts of the, all of it automated, like we see package, release, configure, monitor, automated, create, verify, and package um, is all version control. So every time you're creating something, you have the version of what you've created, you've verified it, and you've packaged, and you've had different various versions of that put together in, in, in one platform. And so this pipeline becomes really, really key. Now you might be wondering what is a pipeline and what it actually sort of looks like. So here is an example of a pipeline where it actually goes into a build, prepare, test, post test, post cleaning for um, security. Um, so it goes into all these different, different stages, very again, small steps, small changes of different sort of scannings uh, so it could be uh, security scans, continuous scans, uh, or it could also be configuration and development. But this is what it sort of looks like. It's typical changes and all of that. So if one, one, one part of this pipeline doesn't work, you actually know which part and is able to look into the logs, go back, revisit, rechange, and restart the pipeline because it's, it's all simple steps and easily all synchronized and can be done easily. Security in that pipeline is very, very, very key. So again, with every security part to it, we, we recommend at least having the SAS, DAS, dependency scanning, container scanning, and license management in through that steps of building, building your applications. Um, depending on obviously whether you're building app application, iOS, or there are much more, but these basic scannings need to be part of your every step. So you actually, that can be automated. So as a developer, a full stack developer, you don't need to worry about if, if you're doing all the steps right and you have a pipeline that actually tells you and guides you through that process that yes, you have vulnerabilities in these areas, may consider it. So you as a developer can actually build it quite freely and collaborate as well. And the QA engineer would exactly know where to go for and, and stop it from, from getting developed or, or re, re, redefine the whole development process. So now I'm actually kind of going a little bit into uh, deployment. So once we have kind of the MVCs and, and even MVFs, um, where do we, how do we actually go about this whole deployment? So again, very small, having a good glimpse of what your product might look in the real world, reviewing your apps. So that's a, a, a feature that can actually help you get into um, the pipeline when it's gone through all the security testing to be able to review what your app looks like. This is actually done through um, uh, containers. So it's in GitLab, this is linked into uh, your Kubernetes uh, containers where you can deploy your review apps and actually have a good glimpse of what it looks like before you shift it even into production. So you can make the little changes if you're not happy with it. Uh, and that becomes very, very key in actually this fast iterative cycle to just have a glimpse of what it might look at the real world make the little changes again, make sure it's perfect, and then ship it off to production. So we're talking about um, MV, um, uh, a little bit of the deployments, and that goes back into, again, uh, a, a part that we talked about in the time to change of infrastructure as code. Um, this is also really, really important where you don't, if you have infrastructure as a code, so it's this whole concept of having the full code packaged up as infrastructure makes deployment a lot easier. So a lot of the times, uh, many, many 
frustrations come from actually uh, waiting for configuration, misalignments of environments. So when you have something like a code full package as infrastructure, it's easy. You can just deploy anywhere without actually figuring out all your configurations and and uh, and the environments are okay and everything that needs to be perfect for the deployment. Again, little little steps that makes your job easier and faster. Uh, uh, tools or mechanism or process just just to make it seamless. So. Having a good understanding of all of this, so what are we in GitLab and a Tatum Craft and what we believe always improve. So we started off in 2011 <laughs> with uh, source code and issues, uh, so it's just SCM. But then we realized all the different gaps, taken the feedback from all our different customers and kept on building from 2011 to all the way still building only i have 2019 till here but trust me we still keep on building in 2020 um of a full life cycle for your devops uh, journey so whether it's all the way from idea to production every little feature that i've gone through has been taking the feedback implemented of moving just not from source code management we're going to take care of your continuous integration to your continuous delivery to actually uh, analyzing post delivery security all of that put together so the same boxes how we see in 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 the pipeline gitlab what they've done or what we've done is from manage all the way to that production, a single conversation, single data source, a single permission model, single interference, governments and security, tool that can enhance your team collaboration and also your lifestyle analytics. So how you are performing in every step of the way to one single application. How did we do that? Now, concurrent DevOps. It has three teams. The first team is visibility. So real-time view across the entire life cycle. So there's as five motors, see everything that matters, stay in the flow, don't wait on syncing. And that's really, really key. So don't wait. Uh, you can concurrently keep on working on your things manage projects not tools so make the tools as easy as possible but focus on actually the ideation of the project and making the project better and improve the cycle time so just getting better and better uh with the whole end-to-end -end life cycle time just faster faster and easier unlocking the velocity efficient so always start start now work together, work with the whole team, collaborate it. And no more of the ham, ham, handoffs. So lots of people, again, with concurrent DevOps can work together, not waiting for the developer team to finish and then the operation team to actually work on something. People can actually come together in this one platform and just work all side by side. And another, which is a team, a, with all ethical DevOps is governance. So security, auditability, compliance, uh, Expedia, the auditing process through every stages of the life cycle is also key. So to be able to actually know and not have DevOps as actually a black box. So you know and you're able to act with certainty how the code is de deployed, eliminate all sorts of guesswork, and then have incremental rollouts, you may roll out 10%, 20% to understand the impact and reduce the change of impacts. So again, we looked into that feature of review app, which helps you actually give you that certainty of what you're deploying. So government is a key to all of this. So for today and tomorrow within GitLab, um, and this is probably not just GitLab, this is extended to, in general, the themes in, in, in DevOps uh, and what people, what our customers are actually looking for uh, based on our customer feedback. A uh, lot of automation, uh, 
the automation part, it's just going to get more and more and more um, integrated into this full life cycle journey. Continuous integration, so um, uh, CI uh, in the DevOps world, having all those different life cycle, which seamlessly is a part of automation, but integrating with all the different tools and technology uh, to be able to uh, build and package and verify is important. The delivery, similar once you've integrated, CD comes part of the CI. Similar pipeline structures of all different various apps, integration, important. The other part is continuous feedback. So that whole concept of actually then doing into production, but aligning it back to business and figuring out the objectives of where and how you can do better, that being automated and continuous is also very key. Some of the other topics uh, that, are uh, that are coming out is obviously cloud, deploying all your applications in cloud, containerization to make like we see having infrastructure as code, but being able to deploy it fast, easily, um, and, and be comfortable with what you're deploying with security is also key. So software development is just getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And you have one development to, to five, to hundred, to thousand. So all of this put together actually gets that software excellence as a new competitive advantage. The sixth part, the AI and ML part of it is actually my, my favorite one that comes from the background I come from. Um, that becomes a key in actually building all this software as well. So having, having the historic data to be able to help operationalize a lot of these machine learning applications uh, into the cloud um, as, as the DevOps for machine learning or machine learning for DevOps is, is also key for, for the next coming years. So with that, that's all I had to share. Um, and um, I think I'll be open to question. I do, um, I do actually also have a feedback form, which I can actually put in the Q&A. Your feedback is important. It is valuable. So I would love to actually um, have some feedback. It is not mandatory, so please uh, don't be, feel pressured, but, um, but I'll, I'll, I'll probably just link this form as well into the Q&A. Yeah. No. Oh, okay. I see some some chat. Okay, here is the form. It is in the chat crew. Um, now I'm gonna just go to um, some of the questions. Are we able to access the recorded presentation after? Uh oh. <laughs> I am not sure if I'm the right person for the question. Um, is someone, hopefully someone from Girls in Tech um, can, can get back, but um, I, okay, there you go. Yes, you can. <laughs> um, all right, I would love to have the slide deck afterwards if possible. Um, yeah, so I, I think, yeah, that can be shared. Um, I will send a PDF version as well, absolutely. Um, very informa informative session, learning quite a bit. Thank you. <laughs> I'm glad you've learned. Um, coming from testing background, I would like to know how important are QA testers in DevOps kind of, unless they develop, develop across functions and don't stick to testing alone. So um, it is very, very, very important. Um, it's, a, it's also a field because if you think about it, um, it's, it's growing exponentially. And there are a lot of different um, ethical, um, 
ethical boundaries that suddenly you've never thought about before you are you are needing to think uh, and it, it also includes with you know your log data sharing uh, are you are you installing the right packages or things like that so it depends on the maturity of your organization um, of where you are in that cycle but it is it is it is actually going to emerge as a field by itself and you will have people within the devops team as just focusing just on qa and testers so that is an emerging field so from a gitlab perspective we are building more in the security respect um, the auditing of it the compliance of it we we've, we've recognized how important it is and we want to be able to give our customers the tools to be able to do that so um i think it's it's a little bit for personal if you want to be all horizontal but if if qa testers are very important it is and it will just get more and more <laughs> through the years i hope that answers the question um okay um i have another one uh what would you like product and us teams to keep in mind when working with DevOps or developers in general? Um, yes, um, so that's a good question. So I think it actually goes back to a little bit of uh, that people skills. Um, so collaboration and openness is, 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 is really, really key. And actually, um, so, Originally, uh, developers, um, we, we didn't, when it actually started, this whole concept of DevOps, if you think about how it was in 2009 and 2010, it was a lot of, um, it was just about, um, and a little bit is still kind of there, but it is just literally, you know, these caveman developers who would just sit in silos and they want to do their own thing and, and code and then don't disturb them. And, and then, and then once they are done and push it to UX or push it to that, but that is sort of changing now and it has to. So um, being able to both sides understand your own languages and actually having, let's say a agile way that like, that can board way, uh, Kanban way, where both both teams are working together simultaneously at the same time, um, is is really really important. And and then being able to actually um, a little bit of the UX team understand the DevOps language and a little bit of DevOps understand UX language, and having some sort of framework tools to help you translate that language. So Kanban is a good example. Um, but in general, putting your customer first or the business outcome first is also a good starting point to actually go back and have that conversation. So it's all about that outcome and that value rather than I'm a DevOps and I'm a UX and we don't speak together if, if that actually helps. Um, uh, what do you think is the biggest difference in culture and our operation that create a success versus failure environment or good versus bad? Um, so from a culture's perspective, again, it's, it is that people skill. <laughs> so um, it goes back to um, having a clear, um, clear understanding of, um, of, uh, of the vision, uh, what is the vision? So in GitLab, the vision is putting um, putting the uh, call, uh, putting the customer first, where everyone can contribute and and collaborate together. So having that sort of a vision, rather than oh, I I want to build a um, I, I just uh, I'm part of a COVID app, so I want to build a COVID app. That's great, but what is that vision then? How are you gonna do it? Um, so that is really, really important. The other part is that art part that we looked into uh, the streaming engine example is being able to actually adapt and continuously learn from your mistakes. So um, that part is also, also, so you have to be open to your own mistakes and be able to creatively solve that problem using your existing tools. So it is a very um, iterative world. 
uh, things that will consistently keep on changing. So you have to be able to adapt and continuously learn. So going back to those software skills of those 10 different things that will 10 times be needed is basically what you need to be able to successfully um, be successful. Um, uh, yeah, that's about it. Um, I don't see any more questions. Any more questions? Oh, there are questions in the Q and A. Okay. Um, There's a we'll couple more through on chat from Jane Rubri. Jane. Jane Rubri. Is that me to read it? Yeah, that yeah. would be great. How far away are we from referring to developers as DevOps engineers? Where the, op where the operation side really become the norm? Um, so it really, again, um, uh, it, it, it depends a little bit on that organization. There are actually organizations uh, which actually function uh, with operations being, being the norm or, or that the whole DevOps as one unit already, uh, but it, but and so the more you uh, the more the DevOps culture gets uh, uh, reaches the full audience, the more it's going to get more integrated into it. But having said that, um, in the next ten years, with all that automation and so many applications getting deployed into production, uh, people will slowly, slowly, slowly get more and more and more into DevOps engineer. And within 10 years, to be honest, I actually don't know where it's going to be. We might actually have a totally new title with so much automation going on that uh, we'll just be actually having more coffees and have a click on button plan to production all done. So don't know where that's going to go. But yes, I think uh, right at this moment, there are already that that shift happening is just going to get accelerated more and more. Um, yeah. Is there more questions? Any more questions? Did I miss any? I think that's all for questions. Um, it looks like the recordings in Thai Day's program will be available through the Git network. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, I did send a feedback form. So if anyone wants to fill in, would love, love, love to get all the feedback. And yes, we will be sharing all the discussions and uh, yeah, well, thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, well, I hope everyone is safe through COVID. Enjoy the rest of the Girls in Tech conferences. And um, thank you for joining this. Yeah, I'm not sure actually how, um, I think we, we get cut at, okay, there are more questions in the live Q&A. Okay, I've got some questions here, Mon. Yeah. Okay, so how do you suggest oh, for that? <laughs> yeah. Still figuring out all the questions and everything. Yeah. Um, so how do you suggest introducing DevOps culture into a company with 750,000 plus people? I'm part of this team who will be leading this change and the task is daunting to say the least. Would you incremental step change in ways of working be the ideal approach? So set up people with new systems or would it be better to go hard and go fast? Set up multiple systems and bring people into them fresh project by project. 
Um, so similar, I would do incremental changes. So again, even to set up a culture, uh, instead of actually uh, having a full force into it, because even being actually sensitive with the way that there will be a lot of fear of aversion. So it's a process change. It's a culture change, uh, the way a person looks into it. So even simple things, right? Like so some people are so used to just sending an email and then the rest of the team doesn't have visibility. So having that sort of little, little changes of having that shared platforms, um, shared document visibly. So little, little incremental changes, uh, being very receptive of, of uh, the general culture now, the current culture now, taking those little, little changes, um, whether it can be also you, you try to, um, uh, try to implement it for a certain uh, application or a certain business unit uh, and actually see if that works. Uh, have a little bit of um, A-B testing of the culture as well. Uh, experiment it and see where it kind of goes, if it adds value. And then totally, uh, slowly, slowly then roll it out, uh, incrementally roll it out to different teams uh, in different times to be able to then um, go from MVC to MVP. Okay, we've got another question. Yep. What would you like product and UX teams to keep in mind when working with DevOps or developers in general? Um, collaboration. <laughs> so being uh, being very very open uh, open to uh, to understanding the language, each other's language. So active listening, collaboration, and and realizing that at the end of it, you're building one product. You may be two different entities, but you're building one product. So being open to it. Yeah. Okay. And next one, your swag in the Git swag is amazing. <laughs> Why do you think DevOps teams should use GitLab over the other providers? <laughs> um, so it, it really, really, again, um, depends. Um, like I said, uh, we, for us, it, it's, it's a platform where um, you are not uh, you're a part of us because we are a unit team that you can contribute and we can make each other's products better together. So uh, you're not, you're not like an external customer. You're a part of us. Uh, I think we went through one example of this customer coming and they wanted a change in a product and we were able to deliver it. So yeah, so no, going through the DevOps maturity journey, we would be one team together as one unit and also, um, this is pretty much one platform where you can actually do a full end-to-end -end DevOps with one tool. Uh, so there you go. So you can have more time uh, just actually uh, brainstorming and, and, and figuring out your software excellence and let the tool do a lot of that um, automation pipelines and everything going on with it. So yeah, choose GitLab. <laughs> And that looks like it's for questions at this point. Yeah. Any more? I think we'll just give it a minute, maybe. Yeah, I think that should be it. No more questions. Yeah, I think uh, if no more question, I'm pretty sure people can take 10 minutes back <laughs> into their lunchtime. 
before their next session, but I'll, I'll still be here till 12.15 because I think we're automatically taken out. So I'll be here till 12.15 for any other questions. But if ever, anyone else wants to jump out and have their lunch till the next, please feel free to do so. And thank you so much.